Um, all right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, there's we have a lot of online participants. Um, so for the people sitting at the tables up here, you have the, the little red lights in front of you. You have to press that button. For, ah, press the button in the front if, if you want to speak. Um, for the people in the back, um, we'll probably run a mic to you if you want to speak, or we can repeat the questions for you. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll work that out as it goes. Um, OK, so this is the, uh, we want to have this, this session on PhotoZ commissioning plans, um, because we're starting to make plans for what we're going to do for PhotoZs during commissioning phase, because Ruben needs to provide PhotoZs for all the galaxies in the catalog. Um, and so we're assembling a team that, that's going to start making plans for that. And we wanted to figure out kind of what needs to be done and get all the stakeholders together in the room to kind of start that discussion. Um, so we have invited representatives from all of the extragalactic uh, science collaborations that, that need photosies to do their science. Um, we've invited them to you know, introduce themselves if they have thought of any commissioning plans so far to share those with us, um, either plans they have or, or demands, needs they need from the commissioning process to make sure that photo, they have the photosies they need to do their science. Um, in addition to that, we've invited a few organizations such as uh, Link, Linnea, and Rail who are not science collaborations, but are, are groups that have resources they want to provide to this process and, and help us with the photo Z commissioning. Um, so we're going to go through all those intros first, and then the remaining time we will uh, leave for uh, you know, questions and discussions. So that hopefully when we leave the session today, we at least have a kind of a rough outline of, of what we need from commissioning and what we need to do for commissioning, so that when data starts coming off the telescope, we can start doing science with our photo Zs. Um, so we can go ahead and, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, please obey the code of conduct. And uh, we have a lot of virtual participants. Um, can you drop your, if, if you're online and you have questions, please drop your questions in the Slack channel, not in the, uh, the BlueJeans chat. And uh, my co-facilitator, Alex Maltz, is on BlueJeans, and he'll be uh, monitoring your, uh, your, your questions on the Slack. That. Um, so first, I'll pass it off to uh, Melissa Graham to discuss uh, photo Z commissioning from, from the Ruben DM perspective. Thank you, John Franklin. Uh, yes, yeah, so today I'm going to cover, uh, just like give a really brief introduction to photo Z's and Ruben data management. So um, in the annual data releases, the object table, which is the catalog of all objects detected uh, in the deep coads, that catalog will have photometric redshift estimates that are generated by Rubin Observatory and available in the catalog at the time of data release for you to use for your science. Data management um, will select one or more existing community vetted algorithms that meet a set of minimum scientific attributes and serve the widest variety of science applications uh, at that time to, to, make, to create those uh, photo Zs. So um, doing that, though, is a really big job. The science community are the ones who are best uh, poised to provide input on what kind of photo Zs and to scientifically validate those photo Zs that do go in that object catalog. So we have a roadmap for this process that started a year or two ago and goes uh, straight up through operations. So just as a reminder, you can find everything that I'm going to say in our data management tech note. Um, hold on. You can find everything I'm going to say in our data management tech note is 049. That's DMTN 049. Um, all right. So last year we had this phase of letters of recommendation uh, regarding object photo Z. And so though that was a time when we asked the science community to either recommend specific algorithms that they thought would be really well suited to produce object photo Zs or um, to, to recommend different um, science application use cases that they really needed for those photo Zs that we should take into account when we're making the decision of which community vetted algorithm to choose. So that happened. Um, we had the photo Z, the, these letters of recommendation come in late last year. We summarized them and shortlisted five photo Z estimators earlier this year. 
Um, in mid-2022, we formed the PhotoZ commissioning team, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And then looking forward, uh, that team is going to work throughout 2023. Um, and what they're going to be doing is basically preparing, like doing a couple of early installs of several of these shortlist, shortlisted PhotoZ estimators into the Rubin Science platform and the LSST Science pipelines um, to start testing things and getting them implemented so that when Data Preview 1 is released um, by July 2024, we, will, we can start what we call the PhotoZ Validation Cooperative. So it's with that data set, that release Data Preview 1, that you will all be able to um, test a wider variety of estimators, test the performance, test the results, um, mimic your science uh, investigations, and so on. And then looking even further down the line, we have the survey start, we have data, um, data preview two coming out, and then we move on to data release one by January 2026. <clears throat> So those letters of recommendation invited the community to define their minimum scientific needs or advocate for one or more photos of the estimators. Um, DMTN 049 is where we define those minimum scientific attributes along with all the, the technical constraints that go along with um, the type of photos of the estimator that can be implemented into the Rubin Science Platform and LSST Science Pipelines. There were 20 submissions in total and they're all available in the Rubin Community Forum. 13 of them advocate for particular estimators, um, whereas six describe more science use cases and related needs. And one was more of a non-letter of recommendation from desk um, that sort of talked about their photo Z work, um, a lot of complementary things going on in desk. So the five estimators that were eventually shortlisted that have like a, a proven track record um, of performance and also met all the technical constraints were GPZ, DEMP, DNF, LIFAR, and uh, the BPZ estimators. So those are the ones we're gonna be looking to first that this PhotoZ commissioning team will focus on and trying to implement um, at, like as soon as possible as test cases. So this PhotoZ commissioning team that I mentioned, uh, most of their activity is gonna be between 2022 and 2024. Everyone was in invited to join. It was a, kind of an open call, mostly focused on the people who submitted letters of recommendation. Um, and the goals of this team are to develop the infrastructure for PhotoZ validation within the Rubin Science platform. They'll then guide early implementation and validation for at least a few of those shortlisted PhotoZ estimators. They'll have access to the pre-release commissioning data to do so. And eventually all that work that they're about to do is going to enable broader participation in that PhotoZ validation cooperative that I talked about before, which will happen once the DP1 uh, data is released. So I put a, a list of the people who are currently involved in this PhotoZ commissioning team here. And what did I wanna tell you here? Yeah, yeah. So these people, they'll be in place. And um, by the time Data Preview 1 comes out, they'll have assembled the experience and infrastructure to support your work uh, in validating more photos de estimators um, with the DP1 data set. And um, yeah, so if you're interested in photos these, but not at the level where you want to commit significant amount of time to actually work on commissioning data, but you are interested in maybe doing the photos uh, validation cooperative later, but you're wondering what to do now. So until then, um, the best advice is to join an LSST science collaboration, such as DESK, try to participate in our data preview zero, uh, if possible. And also to join the Rubin Community Forum and set yourself to watching the photometric redshifts category, because we tend, intend to make um, public announcements and track all of our work there publicly, so you can sort of follow along with what's going on or make recommendations and just basically keep yourself informed on the process. And that's all I wanted to tell you about our PhotoZ roadmap, but am I doing questions now? Or are we doing them later? Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about this, um, pick, basically picking up where, where Melissa left off and talking in a little bit more detail uh, about the perspective from commissioning science verification validation. So uh, there are not requirements, system level requirements in 
the observatory system specification and the LSST system requirements that are specifically related to galaxy photometry in the sense we don't have normative requirements with specific quantitative uh, values. However, evaluating galaxy photometry is one of the most important components of commissioning science validation, right? It's basically providing the assurance that you can do general extragalactic astronomy with Rubin data. So photosies are a huge part of this, right, in terms of validating galaxy colors and, you know, and, and just the, the photosies themselves. So recognizing this importance, uh, the current planning for the on-sky observations with LSST cam includes deep multi-band imaging of fields that would be suitable for developing and testing photo Z estimators, because we recognize that this is a long lead time item in order to have these estimators implemented and tested prior to LSST DR1. And ideally uh, to have them ready for the data previews so that you can begin the photo Z cooperative. So we wanted to get this work started as soon as possible. So um, this is envisioned currently as one of the top priorities for the on-sky observations during commissioning after achieving system first light. So to remind people, uh, system first light is defined as when we are achieving good image quality and throughput over the full focal plane. So once we get to that point, the current planning is, is that we will begin uh, observations likely in a deep drilling field where we would get to something like 1,000 to 2,000 exposures across multiple bands, as many bands as we can cover. Uh, this would get you to something like uh, 10 to 20 year uh, LSST depth. And it's likely that these observations would be you know, intermixed with some engineering uh, activities that are related to system optimization. So there'll be likely some initial mix of, of science and engineering activities. Uh, but what we'd ideally like to do is, you know, take take some most likely an LSST deep drilling field and basically do a series of dithers reaching this kind of depth, such that you would ultimately cover a few tens of square degrees. Okay. Ideally, we would do something similar with ComCam, but it might be that schedule pressures make it such that that's a very tight time window. We won't get as much data, but this would be one of the top. I would say, yeah, perhaps the top priority that, that we would do with ComCam if we have spare, any spare time to take uh, on-sky science grade imaging. There's a possibility uh, that during the LSST CAM science validation surveys, uh, which come after that system optimization phase, uh, one of the items on the menu is uh, something that looks like a pilot uh, LSST wide fast deep survey. They would be covering something like a thousand square degrees in multiple bands. Uh, another possibility would be trying to increase the uh, LSST deep drilling field coverage, um, just to give a sense of the possibilities during that time period. And these would be included in data preview too. This would also be available for photo Z testing, validation, um, and implementing the estimators. So a lot of this design was based on the community source suggestions. Um, so I put the links here uh, where you can find more information from, from the science collaborations, uh, basically providing input on what fields we should be observing and what types of observations we should do during commissioning. So with regards, so that's, that's the part on the on-sky observing. Uh, with re regards to how this is sort of organized and fits within the commissioning uh, team, uh, what we are imagining is that this photo Z uh, commissioning team that uh, that Melissa just described is that they would become embedded uh, within the wider uh, Rubin Observatory commissioning science team, and that most likely this would occur uh, through what we've been thinking of as a, as a science unit, basically a, a working group uh, that's devoted to galaxy photometry, including photo Z. And so what this would do is they would provide an opportunity for uh, these individuals who have access to the pre-release data uh, basically to get engaged with the broader commissioning effort to make sure that their efforts on the photo Z estimator side uh, basically feed back into the broader commissioning science validation effort. So let me pause there and see if there's any questions. Hopefully none of this is surprising. Sorry, when are you picking these deep fields? So because of uncertainty in the schedule, 
we are currently planning not to do the really detailed planning until something like three months in advance when we have a better sense of when we're going to go on sky because we'll, we will need to pick fields that are suitable for that season. I would say that we can probably start now to refine the, the menu of fields and we would likely be, be drawing them from the suggestions here. Um, this idea of doing the, the deep observations is, is partly driven by, from the project side, what we need to do for commissioning science verification. But given that we have some flexibility in terms of exactly where we point, we basically want to do those observations that in, in a way that maximizes opportunity for science validation, including photo disease. And so that's why we're currently planning on one of the deep drilling fields. What, you know, whatever is available during that season is the most likely target. Um, but if there are other locations on the sky that would be preferable, it would be very good to communicate this to, to me and Robert to, to make sure that we have that in our planning. Well, so I, I bring this up in that if, if you choose Cosmos or XMM, depending on time of year, then from DESI, you can get the 100,000 plus available redshifts anywhere else, SOL. Right, right, right. right. So, I mean, I, I would say basically <clears throat> if it happens during springtime, Cosmos, right? And if it happens uh, during the fall, then, uh, then the other field that you were describing. That, I think that's the most likely candidate, effectively. So it'll, it'll basically be determined by the season at that point. Yes. Um, so if you do a smaller version of this using ComCam, um, what kind of area do you think you will cover? You know, it's it's really driven by the schedule and how much time we have available. And we I don't think we will really know realistically until we we get closer to the time. The current thinking is what we would do is that we would basically, so ComCam is, is the nine sensors in a three by three array. And that we could basically try to synthesize the LSST CAM field of view um, and, and, and try to build up that, that sort of a, a amount of area uh, to give a sense you can if you can take something like 800 visits in a night then LSST 10-year depth in one band for example in R and I is about 200 visits so you could get to in one night you could get to something like equivalent of LSST 10-year depth in a couple bands uh, in practice right because of air mass constraints and observability that might happen over over a couple nights but basically, if we had something like a week or two of sustained observing with ComCam, we could cover an area of you know several square degrees to that depth in multiple filters. And so, basically, I, I would I would strongly advocate for taking a little you know at least a few nights to do that because I think we will learn so much from even even that modest amount of data. Yeah, my my comment was that I think that would be very very valuable to yeah. do a smaller version with ComCam. Yeah, so at least at least some of this information is is in the schematic that you may have seen in either the the early science or the uh, the commissioning uh, science verification validation session. Um, so so again, this this is you know gives sort of a, a broad scope of what we've been thinking about. But I think the part that may be most relevant, what we were just talking about, is this the system optimization phase, and this is where we you know likely be targeting one of these deep drilling fields and going going to this amount of depth. Other questions? All right. Uh, thanks, Keith. So, oh, it's not on my computer. It's over here. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so now we can start hearing from the science collaborations. Um, so we'll start with the Galaxy Science Collaboration. We'll hear from Sam Schmidt, who is online. Okay, um, so the Galaxy Science Collaboration encompasses a fairly wide range of science application, all the way from faint uh, local galaxies all the way to the highest redshift galaxies that we can observe. Um, and what complicates our, our overall goals as a science collaboration is that 
uh, not only do we want accurate redshifts or, or well-determined redshifts, uh, we also normally need uh, jointly derived physical parameters for a lot of our science, star formation rate, stellar mass, rest frame colors, et cetera. Uh, and doing that uh, in detail is rather difficult computationally and in terms of storage. Um, also, given this range all the way from low redshift to the highest redshift uh, possible, it's going to be very difficult to meet all of the needs of the science collaboration with a general purpose Rubin uh, provided DM catalog. However, we do want to get as close as we can with those uh, the, the catalog level um, photo Zs as we can, and then work on uh, adding uh, supplemental information for galaxy specific science. Uh, within the galaxy science collaboration, there are in-kind efforts, uh, one shared and one specific to galaxies for two of the five um, shortlisted estimators that Melissa mentioned, uh, DEMP and GPZ, uh, that are uh, aimed at simultaneously deriving such physical parameters either jointly with redshift uh, in, in the estimators themselves or fitting redshift and then as a post-processing step with Seagal fit physical parameters separately and, and test whether that, that uh, results in um, cases that cover all of our science needs. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit more to this. Uh, we wrote up a letter of uh, recommendation uh, from the call for Melissa. You can uh, look at the notes after the session and, and check the, the link here or just search on community in the photo Z space. Uh, go to the next page, please. Uh, specifically for commissioning, uh, we don't have many firm plans within the Galaxy's science collaboration, uh, but I will say, as I mentioned, we have these two um, in-kind contributions for DMP and GPZ. I think the natural place for those to, to reside and make progress is uh, in RAIL that you'll hear about later in the session and the PZ Validation Cooperative. That is actually taking data, running these on either the DPs or the, the first data release, testing whether we can actually get to the physical parameter estimates and get to the, to the needs of the science collaboration within the, the requirements that we have. Uh, the physical parameter estimates obviously benefit greatly from having extra bands. You get just better overall fits, especially by adding near-infrared data. So Keith mentioned deep fields during the validation cooperative, having some way to access the near-infrared data uh, from Cosmos CDFS or some other uh, deep field with multi-wavelength data and um, either true redshifts or true redshifts and estimates of physical parameters would be greatly beneficial in testing our results. Um, for optimal results, we really want some way to do joint processing with at least the near infrared data. This is, of course, well beyond the scope of the validation cooperative, but just thinking about it as a need that multiple science collaborations will probably have uh, is something we can start thinking about. Um, I mentioned we also have uh, members in the collaboration who use Seagal, which is a, a, um, an SED fitting library uh, that fits physical parameters and SEDs. Uh, they may be able to add some expertise in the validation cooperative for SED, um, SED type codes like BPZ and LaFar that were also on the short list. Uh, and again, longer term information from Euclid or Roman would greatly improve the physical parameter estimates. And it's up to the Galaxy Science Collaboration to figure out how to how to work that into our processing. So, are there any uh, questions for Sam before we move on to the next Science Collaboration? Um, I think I have one, Sam. Um, do you know, would, would it be sufficient for galaxies needs to focus on just validating the, uh, the photo Z posteriors by themselves during commissioning and wait till after commissioning is over to work on the, the joint posteriors? Or is that something that galaxies is expecting validated from the start of the survey? Uh, my guess is that we would want them at start of the survey to really start doing science. So I think we, again, it's, it's not the responsibility of the validation cooperative, but galaxy science collaboration members to work on that. Though, again, the DEMP and GPZ have, if set up to do this, can predict physical parameters as well. And so as those are on the short list, those are probably the place to start uh, in, in trying to do this. And getting Galaxy's people to work in the validation cooperative is the most natural way to make that happen. Uh, 
OK, if there are no other questions. Then we can move on to the strong lensing science collaboration. Um, um, so, oh. Hi, uh, so thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak. So for strong lensing, it, it follows very naturally from what Sam was just talking about. We're also interested in photo Z's as well as galaxy properties. Um, and I think what I wanted to point out is that strong lensing are effectively very complicated fields in different ways. Um, we have crowded cluster fields right through to to individual galaxy galaxy lenses where blending of the the source images and the lens itself can be and are known to be problematic for getting accurate photo Z's. Um, but all our science cases benefit from good photo Z's for both the lens and the source. Um, and I just wanted to, so the, the figure that you see on, on the left is just a composite of, of different scales of lenses. Um, but I'll just focus quickly on the right, which is kind of our schematic for elements of the strong lensing pipeline. And, and the yellow boxes kind of highlight where photo Z's come into our whole kind of strong lensing process. So the biggest issue with strong lensing in, is in discovery, um, and particularly that we will, even in, with early years of LSST, we will still be in the regime where we have, where we're expecting to have something like 10 to the 5 strong lenses across the survey, but we'll have candidates at least factors of 100 or more bigger than that due to the high rates of false positives in any automated algorithms to search for lenses. And so photo Z's have a role in that, in the sense that you could use, for example, accurate uh, photo Z's for the lensed images as a filter or a ranking method um, to sift out false positives from true positives. Um, so actually getting the, the source redshifts is important. Um, knowing that the source redshift is in fact a, a higher redshift than the lens is already a, a first pass that's very critical. Um, but also moving on from that, once we have these candidates, we also want to have plausible models for them. Again, it's another way of sifting out candidates, but it also then allows us to do the physics, measure the masses and do start doing some of the analysis. And obviously having good uh, source and lens redshifts breaks a lot of degeneracies in the modeling. And uh, it's much easier to, to get good parameters out if we can constrain those things rather than leaving them as free parameters in the lens modeling. Then we, as all of us are experiencing, we are all going to be resource starved in terms of follow up for all the, the exciting things we're going to discover. And that certainly applies to strong lensing as well. So we really will not have time to spectroscopically confirm all the lenses that we're going to find. Um, so we do want to use photo Z's again to help us optimize where we focus our follow up efforts. Um, and also we have a program on the foremost telescope to basically fill fibers with strong lenses in the fields that they're going to be covering as part of the tide survey. And actually the photo Z's that we can get early on will help us prioritize targets um, for search follow-up. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So in terms of, you know, um, what the critical issues are, I mean, you can kind of see it from the images on the left. We have, you know, images that are very close into the lens. Uh, there's a case on, on the extreme uh, left column where you, see, where you basically don't see the lensed images because the lens itself is so bright. Um, so the blending is really the key to get accurate um, lens and source redshifts for strong lenses. So this is all hand in hand with um, Scarlet or whatever the blending uh, algorithm is, uh, is part of um, the Rubin pipeline. Um, and that will allow us to get the accurate photometry to get good photo Z's and also the properties of the galaxies. So there's been, you know, a number of issues with basically extracting those good photo Z's. And primarily the, the issue is the kind of pollution of the lens light uh, in the source images. So if we, uh, so there's been a study by Langrudi there that is, uh, is uh, linked in the slides. And the main factors affecting accuracy is, is how well you can define the, the shape of the lens um, and also the contrast between the lens flux and the image flux that you're trying to get uh, the measure of the photometry of. 
So if you have the case where um, the lens is, sorry, the image is brighter than the lens, then you can do reasonably well with current, you know, um, lens subtraction methods and then template fitting, and you get outlier fractions of about 20%. In the regime where, you know, the lens is really struggling to appear, sorry, the source image is struggling to appear above the, the flux of the lens, then that really is, you know, a catastrophic rate. You know, we were at 75% um, of outliers, which basically renders the whole process um, very difficult, particularly if you if you have a very small Einstein radii. So while I think, you know, the case where we have very bright lensed images will be okay, but beyond that, um, which will be a lot of the cases, we really need and rely on good deblending to get the accurate photometry. Um, so that's kind of where we are at the moment in terms of commissioning. All these things can be tested at commissioning, both in the initial type survey and the you know five to ten known lenses, some of which will have spectroscopy in um, in that initial survey. Um, and then moving on to something like uh, 500 plus in the wide, fast, deep. It's verification serve. will be there and they will be things that we will be testing in um, in commissioning and te testing kind of our own algorithms for how to extract good photometry uh, versus the standard deblending. Um, also, in terms of you know what what we can expect to get out from these estimators, and we have been working with the GPZ team um, in looking at kind of how they can help with um, strong lensing uh, photo Z estimates, particularly because you can also um, so Peter Hatfield did a lot of work on and Zara Gomez on on kind of doing hybrid um, template and GPZ fitting, which might work very well for strong lenses. So there is the strong lensing in, in the GPZ LOR, um, and that's where we're currently going to focus our efforts on trying to establish how well we can extract photo Zs um, to apply to the whole of the strong lensing pipeline uh, in commissioning as we go forward into the main survey. Thank you. Thanks. Um... <clears throat> Because we're running behind schedule, we're going to save the questions for the uh, Q&A at the end. Um, but if you have any questions you want to ask now, um, please drop them in the chat so we can remember to come back to them. Okay. So um, my oh, name is Mark. Yes, you can apply. I'm, um, okay. um, so now we'll move on to desk. Sorry. <laughs> um, so my name is Markus Rau. I'm the co-convener of the Photosy Working Group with Shahab, and we are also members of the commissioning team. Um, so I will give a little bit of a perspective from, from the DESK side. So DESK is the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. As the name suggests, we are very interested in uh, accurate cosmology and constraining the dark energy equation of state. And what our goal in terms of science is um, is shown here on the right hand side in this very nice uh, Fisher ellipse um, that shows the, the expected constraint um, in our final year uh, in uh, W0 and WA space. The um, basic problem um, that we are facing with LSST being a very deep and very large uh, photometric survey and optical filters is of course that this um, um, that there is a strong dependency on photometric redshift um, on, on the photometric redshift error, in particular on the reconstruction of the line of sight distribution of galaxies, um, and biases in, in these quantities can can um, propagate into systematics uh, in in contours like like shown here on the right hand side, which will uh, hamper our ability to to um, perform accurate inference. So we are also a very vibrant and inclusive scientific community, and everybody is very welcome to join us. Um, and we, you know, every every help we we get is is very very welcome. Um, and um, another aspect that's very important for us is that we um, need to perform inference on on the full uh, sample of LSST galaxies, being cosmology. Um, so um, the big data challenges are um, very important for us, and we develop our pipelines really with that in mind. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
So um, I will give you a little bit of a perspective on our um, commissioning goals. So um, first of all, um, we develop a, a pipeline within uh, DESK that is really geared towards producing uh, both um, redshift distributions for individual galaxies and redshift di uh, distributions of samples of galaxies uh, to, um, to high accuracy. And um, we uh, are planning to run this pipeline, which is called RAIL, and I think you will hear about it uh, later in this, uh, in this discussion, um, on, on the commissioning data um, on, a, on a short time scale. So, we really have the, the plan to, 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 to run this, this pipeline on the commissioning data, and we need, um, we need to work towards facilitating uh, this, um, this, this run through uh, in terms of, of homogenizing um, the catalog structure and the data processing. So uh, just a quick um, overview about our activities related to FOTOZ and specifically towards the development of this pipeline. So the FOTOZ working group is um, developing and validating um, RAIL um, in conjunction with other working groups because our goal is really to, to validate the accuracy of our redshift estimates and the reconstruction of sample redshift distributions uh, to very high accuracy. And that goes beyond comparisons with, with spectroscopic or reference data. It really we, we really have joint efforts to propagate uh, and, and quantify our redshift performance all the way through the full analysis pipeline, con uh, in, you know, together with with other working groups. This is a huge, a huge uh, effort that is supported by um, three pipeline scientists and six in-kind contributors, and a very vibrant and highly active FOTOZ working group. And it's really a, a, the goal to guarantee science readiness to LSST precision and ensure the scalability of RAIL um, to our big data cosmology that we plan to do. So, um, and um, yeah, everybody is very welcome to, to join us and hopefully we can, we can also help uh, out a little bit Ru uh, the, the Rubin plans in order to provide this, this infrastructure uh, to the commissioning plans. Thanks, Marcus. Um, next we'll move to Ashley Villar for TVS. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm here to chat about the needs of the transients and variable stars scientific collaboration um, with a caveat that uh, I'm sure there's other committee member, other members of our collaboration in the audience who should feel more than welcome to chime in via Slack or in person. Um, like many of the other communities, we are clearly a broad set of interests that includes anything that evolves on a fairly rapid time scale for um, intrinsic or extrinsic reasons. Obviously, for this, I'll just uh, focus on some extragalactic science needs. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there is not exactly a well, a quantitative um, need that's to come out of commissioning states that is independent of the needs of DESK, where we clearly largely overlap in our interest in uh, supernovae, where DESK cares about uh, type 1As, and I would argue we care about everything else. That's an oversimplification. Um, so, of course, these transients to extragalactic occur uh, by and large in a host galaxy other than the Milky Way. And um, the important thing for us is largely the fact that a point estimate of the redshift, ideally an accurate one, really helps us with classification of the underlying sources because we can then put it in a rest frame and uh, have a more one-to-one -one comparison of the various physics that we expect. Um, I'm careful to say that we want a point estimate because for the, right now, that is how those are incorporated. That is how redshift information is incorporated into our classifiers. Um, there isn't there isn't a direct way to incorporate a full uh, PDF or a photo Z estimate. Um, I also want to point out that similar to other groups, specifically the Galaxy Science Scientific Collaboration, um, we also have an interest in understanding some physical properties of these galaxies because they have uh, correlations with the likely physics of the transients themselves. So as one example, core collapse supernovae from evolved stars likely should have some active ongoing star formation that would have led to these massive stars dying. Um, and so in some sense, this is easy in many ways to, for us to um, identify in that our own community can make some blue filter cuts on the host. However, um, 
I, I also want to acknowledge that there's clearly dust formation that can happen. And so we are we also understand these degeneracies. And if we could ideally um, detangle them, that would be great. Uh, and then there is much weaker correlation that are, are also just harder to pull out for our own community. So things like um, TDEs, tidal disruption events, seem to prefer something called E plus A galaxies, which are post starburst. And that's not something that as a community we quite can directly identify using only these uh, sparse SEDs. And so um, I also want to echo that having a photo Z uh, code, which can detangle some of these physical measurements of the host would be helpful for us. Um, and then finally, I want to state the fact that it's currently honestly unclear how, uh, what precision we actually need on redshifts to really maximize the accuracy of classification. Um, that we need for various transients. However, there's definitely a growing consensus that um, we really care about understanding the most interesting science that's happening in real time, which we kind of, uh, which we've been labeling as anomaly detection. Um, in this case, it's important to minimize as much as possible catastrophic failure modes of photo Z codes uh, because this greatly impacts our, our search for anomalies in the sense of uh, a type 1A in a host whose redshift is too nearby can look like an extremely exotic transient. Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Um, next, we'll go to the AGN Science Collaboration. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Roberto Sepp, um, uh, heading the uh, subgroup of uh, photometric redshifts within the AGN Science Collaboration, one of the uh, four main subgroups, which also include um, AGN identification, multi wavelength photometry, as well as variability. And all of these divisions are somewhat arbitrary because obviously they are all quite uh, connected. Um, LSSD will be fantastic for AGN. We expect that overall uh, we detect over 10 million quasars and over 100 million AGN, although only able to identify a fraction of those, so tens of millions of AGN. In terms of the photometric redshifts, um, AGN are fu fundamentally more complicated than galaxies. You have an underlying continuum that, uh, that is variable, but it's also quite flat which leads to lots of catastrophic failures uh, as well as inaccurate uh, photometric redshifts. So um, we, um, uh, that's our, our main uh, concerns uh, are, are those, but I would, uh, I, I think it's important to mention that it's probably important for everybody here as well, because an object that is a real agent, but it's not uh, properly characterized as one, is not identified as an AGN, and has a very poor photometric redshift can actually impact all of the other areas of science by contaminating uh, samples. Um, so the, I, I think we submitted a few uh, LORs uh, to, to the call, pointing out the importance of identifying AGN, of trying to know the uh, the ones that are already known, as well as having a photo C code that uh, works with AGN. So one of the photo C codes included is LeFAR, and in particular the NPE in-kind contribution being led by Mara Salvato uh, uh, will provide an AGN optimized version of LeFAR, which uh, as of this moment is what we plan to be the main code for photo Cs in our uh, collaboration. Um, Adding multi-wellet photometry would be fantastic, but I think that will have to be done a, as a, a, a science collaboration a level in, in terms of a photo Cs. I don't think this will be part of the main plan for the main uh, for the main samples of wavelengths outside of the LSSD. Um, but yeah, so those are the basic uh, the basic aspects I wanted to to highlight from our collaboration and. Uh, yeah, just mention how uh, different of a problem it is uh, for, for AGN. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Roberto. So that was the last of our science collaborations. Um, and now we'll move to hearing from those three uh, external groups who hope to contribute to the photo Z commissioning process. Next, we'll hear about Linnea from Julia.
Hi everyone, I am Julia. I am the program manager of the Brazilian in kind contribution program. And our program, which is carried out by Linea, uh, includes a light version of an independent data access center and a list of software development efforts that will generate uh, complementary LSST data products. So this is the key people involved. And uh, one of the contributions related to PhotoZ's is the PhotoZ server, which will be an online service available for the LSST community to host uh, small size PhotoZ related, related data products, such as spectroscopic redshift catalogs, training and validation samples, validation results, and all the relevant metadata associated to it. So we plan to start a test phase very soon to get uh, feedback of users as soon as this uh, preliminary beta version is finished. So the PhotoZ server will also have an API aspect as in form of a Python package. So people uh, will be able to access these data products from, from for instance, the uh, notebook aspects of the Rubin Science Platform or anywhere. And uh, in the commissioning phase, the PhotoZ server will be used to distribute a compilation of public spectros spectroscopic redshifts available, training and validation samples to be used in the, in the PhotoZ validation cooperative, and also to collect results from the participants. Uh, and during the operations, this also can be used as a platform for users to share data and results among uh, the, the collaboration and to have easy access to the relevant metadata. Another contribution related, related to PhotoZ's is the training set maker. Uh, this software will allow users to create their own customized training and validation samples from the combination of spectroscopic catalogs in the PhotoZ server with the LSST objects catalog by doing asynchronous cross-matching uh, using the Brazilian IDEC facility remotely. So they will retrieve only the resulting catalog. Uh, the third contribution is consists in providing alternative PhotoZ tables for the whole LSST objects catalog uh, for every data release during operations. Uh, uh, the which uh, PhotoZ algorithm and the output uh, formats are yet to be defined by the data management. Uh, the data will flow from the main data access center to the Brazilian IDAC, where it will be pro processed to computer photosies, and then the results will be uploaded back uh, and ingested as a federated data set. So during the commissioning, we plan to deliver photosy tables for the data preview catalogs uh, as, as an exercise for the fine tuning of all steps involved of data transfer and processing. And the last contribution is just work time dedicated to help on the commissioning activities. Uh, initially, we plan to contribute specifically on the PhotoZ Validation Cooperative, but uh, I am open to contributing to any task related to commissioning PhotoZs. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we'll hear about Link from Rachel Mandelbaum. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Mandelbaum, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Link Frameworks team. Uh, I'm the Link Frameworks uh, PI, PI at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Andy Connolly, right over there, is the PI at University of Washington. And our director of software engineering, Jeremy Kubica, is back there, I think. Yeah, he, he just waved. Um, so, um, just for those who aren't familiar, um, Link Frameworks is an initiative that aims to provide advances in cross-cutting software infrastructure that's going to enable the community's analysis tools to work at the scale and complexity required for the LSST data. Um, you can check out a recent white paper that's uh, recently been put on archive that came from a workshop we ran back in March, and we've been working with workshop participants since then to pull that together, and, and it essentially outlines um, some areas where additional software development uh, would be very impactful in enabling a wide, a range, wide range of early LSSD science. 
Uh, and one of those areas was photos. -y. So now to speak more directly to the goals of this session about photos -y and commissioning, um, our, the, the Link Frameworks team goals in, in that area are to provide effort from software developers working in close collaboration with scientists on cross-cutting software infrastructure. Um, so you know, the science collaborations necessarily must prioritize photos related infrastructure that enables them to achieve their own goals. Um, and we'd like to supply effort that um, can potentially support multiple science cases, whether that means developing something new or whether it means, for example, taking you know, excellent tooling provided by one science collaboration and supplying effort to enable it to meet a wider range of, of scientific uh, use cases. Uh, at the same time, we recognize there's a lot of effort in, in these areas. Uh, so another of our goals is to help make the best use of the resources available to the community by coordinating our, coordinating our efforts with those in all of the various extragalactic science collaborations that you heard from earlier, um, especially with the desk uh, rail team, which you just heard from, and they've done a lot of really excellent uh, work that's going to be very, very useful for photos and commissioning. And also coordinating with Ruben Data Management and um, with in-kind teams like the Linnea team that you, you also just heard from. Um, we've heard about a lot of different types of activities that might be involved, whether it's work on um, the data representation, you know, the PhotoZ uh, PDF representation, work on optimizing PhotoZ codes to work at scale, and that could include both the 1D codes or the 2D codes that you know, jointly infer redshift and some physical parameters of the galaxies where both the representation and getting them working at scale will be an issue. Um, you've heard about work on you know, extra galactic mock catalogs to test these codes, duration of spectroscopic samples, and so on. So it's a really wide variety of types of effort using a lot of different types of expertise. We do not yet have a, a, you know, a fully defined work plan for link frameworks in this area because we just had our first software developers come on board and they're just starting out their starter projects. But what I can say for now is that you know, the fact that we have software developers working in close consultation with scientists means our team might be more suited for certain types of tasks, you know, optimization, work on data representation, than on others like catalog curation or production of mock extragalactic catalogs involving you know, the, the deep knowledge of the astrophysical uh, systems at play. And um, in the coming months, we look forward to coordinating with these various groups and identifying ways we can provide effort to advance the goals of uh, uh, commissioning photos efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, so that was the last of our uh, prepared presenters. Um, so now we'd like to open up for uh, Q&A and discussion. Um, so if anyone had any questions for any of the people who presented or just for the, the room at large discuss, uh, go ahead and ask now. There's a button on the front. Thanks. Uh, so I have two questions regarding um, the collaboration with other surveys, essentially. Uh, first question uh, regarding um, Euclid, uh, because if I'm not mistaken, for many science cases, uh, using not only LSST but also Euclid photometry is necessary if we want to meet uh, the requirements. Uh, so at what stage and uh, how this collaboration is going to be ensured, whether it is done on the stage of uh, producing photo Z for uh, data releases or it is delegated to science collaborations. And second question is regarding the spectral Z uh, data set used for verification and training, uh, especially considering the high Z regime, uh, essentially what data set is going to be used as a baseline? Obviously that uh, separate teams can add some catalogs, but what is our baseline? What are the data that we take for default? Thanks. Uh, 
Um, so if, if anyone's more knowledgeable about this than I am, please speak up. But um, so first of all, I believe we won't have any Euclid photometry during commissioning. Um, so we won't be able to use Euclid um, as far as photo commissioning goes. Um, so the, the inclusion of, of Euclid photometry for, for science cases is further down the line. Um, I don't know if that will be, if, if the inclusion of, of Euclid data will be left to science collaborations or will be something served by, by Ruben. I, I, I don't know about that. Um, I can also say that as far as the, the extra spectroscopic catalogs that are used for that calibration, um, at least during commissioning, um, is kind of dependent on um, when commissioning happens and which fields are in the sky and which fields we decide to observe in the, uh, during that period. Um, it sounded like there's a high probability that we'll use either uh, Cosmos or um, the the other field that's in the fall that, that I can't remember the name of. Say one more time. XMMLSS. XMMLSS. Because um, I believe those will go both uh, provide us with uh, both DESI spectroscopy for, for tens of thousands of galaxies, as well as the other spectroscopic surveys that have covered those areas. Um, so, so for, I mean, DESI is kind of the elephant in the room in that it, it could do way more than kind of everything else in the world combined. Um, there's been no request from a Rubin project for anything from DESI. So we're just, we've, we've started working on some of these fields in the thought that, gee, good community service, we could build up these fields. Um, we can choose our targets. So there's, you know, there's opportunity here to do plenty. Um, but the, the sooner that we knew about it, the, the easier it would be to do. Uh, and the, I mean, the numbers that we have in these fields, it's, you know, we're already in the 10 to the five regime. And, and we can go, we can go faint. So, uh, you know, people like to think you can't go faint. If you have a really good spectrograph, you can go really faint. Can you comment on this? How faint can you go? Um, so we've, uh, well, we've been testing out at around 24 point something. I mean, our main survey goes to 23.5 on galaxies. Uh, you know, they're selected in a particular part of color space. Um, and we've also been studying kind of where you are in color space, how expensive is it to get spectroscopy? So, you know, if you wanted to really go super deep, there are choices to make where, if, you know, if you just cut out but 20% of color space, that's the most challenging to get uh, redshifts, which are also challenging to do photo Zs, as it turns out. Um, you know, the, then you could go, you know, I don't want to quote a number. It, 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 we, we, ac we actually haven't pushed to the limit of what we can do. Yeah, our gold sample that we use to forecast science performance is roughly I less than 25. So ideally, we'd like to have flux limited sample, no color cuts, flux limited sample down to I less than 25, as many galaxies as you could reasonably deliver. So if it needs to establish some project to project discussion, let's do that to see what, what you can deliver. Can I ask? Um... David, do you actually have do you have it published the um, the kind of color versus um, uh, efficiency of getting spectra? Because that would be really helpful in terms of trying to build up uh, different training samples. Um, yeah, so th this is all new work. It's it's mostly uh, Noah Weaver, Dick, who's doing that work. It's going to be shown tomorrow at the um, there's the uh, Ruben Desi session. Uh, so. If if you could show up there and, and you know, feedback would be welcome on that. Andy won't be there because that's during the link session, but uh, hopefully we can uh, <laughs> get that information afterwards. Uh, did you want to say something, Melissa? Uh, yeah, it took me a minute to remember, but the first part of that question was about Rubin and Euclid. And there's a whole Rubin Euclid derived data products report. Uh, I don't, did someone mention that already? In this room, no, yeah, Ruben Euclid derived data products report. I posted it in the Slack, and it includes um, photometric redshifts. So there's teams of people looking at Ruben Euclid synergies and what kind of data products could be made. Um, 
and made available to the science community and photo disease is, is one of them. So I missed who asked that question, um, but that might be a, a useful resource for you. Um, so one, one more thought on this uh, specific to the commissioning timescale. Um, so if uh, spectroscopy is not available deep enough or in the commissioning fields or um, we, we do have the possibility of, uh, of validating photo Z estimators uh, and, or characterizing them entirely with, with mock data. So the point, the point of rail is to make realistically complex mock data so that you, have, you can test robustness to the unexpected or to the kinds of systematics that we anticipate at, at levels at or more extreme than than we'll likely get, um, and so that's that's a good thing we can do to prepare in the next two years, even if the the spectrum won't be available until later on. Would you like to say something, Melissa? There's a question from the blue jeans. Whenever we're ready to move on, I think we are ready. If you want to read it out. And I'll just invite Charles to unmute and ask his question. Thank you. Uh, I am so impressed hearing this past hour or so all the work that's going on and the thought in here. I, I really, really appreciate it. It, it seems to me, uh, and, and this is not a well-formed question, I think, but it's sort of more open for discussion for people, those of you who have been thinking much more and doing much more about this than I have recently, uh, that several of the groups are thinking more deeply not just about photometric redshifts but actually wanting full-fledged spectral energy distribution fitting i mean ashley was talking about e plus a galaxies for example right um and i know that several of you in the room are in that pan sed group that's been meeting sort of informally over this past year uh, regarding how we actually fit stuff and get real physical parameters i don't think this is a deliverable for for the rubin lsst to get true spectral energy distribution fitting and parameters and success and so forth. But is that where we're headed? At least some of the science collaborations are really wanting to do full-fledged SED fitting rather than just uh, producing a photo Z. And if so, is that something that is fruitful I and mean, could be really valuable? We have a lot of head nodding in the room. So, so I guess I just want to know what, what people are thinking along these lines or planning to do along these lines if there is such a sort of move where, where the photo Z working group or some sort of consensus, photo Z consensus, actually sliding toward a SED fitting consensus as well. And of course, that's even more complicated in some ways than just trying to pick one photo Z scheme. Charles, thank you for bringing this up. This is Eric Gleiser. Hey, Eric. To, hey, Charles. Just to comment on that, we've talked about this in the Galaxy Science Collaboration, and there the intent is to have sort of a light version of SCD fitting be run automatically on every galaxy. We'd really like to get out a stellar mass in addition to a photometric redshift. And as you know, as an SCD fitting expert, you can start to talk about the next parameter and the next parameter. And yes, indeed, it can get too complicated fast. But at least maybe one or two parameters like that, maybe stellar mass and a reddening, or stellar mass and I would never really use the term, but something like a stellar age <laughs> could make sense to us. So I think that's under discussion. It's probably different for every science collaboration. And there's some question about, you know, you can't take it too far and ask it to be in the main pipeline. Fair enough. There are only, what, like 200 floats or something that we can fit in that slot? Um, I, I will say that I know that Andrew Heeren in the DESK collaboration um, has been talking recently a lot about, uh, he has re-implemented FSPS, like one of the uh, stellar population census models for galaxy SCDs, in a, uh, the differentiable JAX language. And he has started to say that he, he thinks it's within reach to be able to run these codes on, on tens of millions, if not more, galaxies. Um, so there, there definitely are people within Desk that are looking in that direction and and are working on the the code and infrastructure to make that a reality for for LSSD. I think also if we're if we're efficient with uh, with 
using the community resources, the, the in-kind contributions, the, the public codes, um, we can we can hit all the base goals and then people can sp can spend more of their science time on on developing like scalable SED fitting methods and, and things like that. So um, so at least on the on the commissioning time scale if we're if we're good at, at planning now then uh, then those things might be within reach by the end of commissioning. Yeah that would be super cool Alex. Okay thanks yeah. Alex for mentioning that. Uh, Eric, again, I just want to make a further comment for those who are not SED fitting experts or who know just enough to think that what I'm talking about sounds really like a bad idea. With just UGRIZY photometry, you can really only do decent SED fitting at low redshift where U band traces the rest ultraviolet, or higher redshifts where you're getting a few ultraviolet bands, but you start to lose the rest from optical. So you have to be very cautious. With this, you could think of it as something with big error bars, but you're getting some information and probably looking at an ensemble of galaxies rather than thinking of it as truth for an individual galaxy. So it's really in the LSST deep drilling fields where we have deep near infrared data, or in places on the sky where we get good overlap with Euclid and eventually Roman, that you could think about trying to do more object by object science out of SED fitting results. And I don't know that we need to take more of the photo Z session to talk about this, but just to set the stage. Right, and and that e even brings up another, uh, if it's okay to bring up another topic, uh, the, the tension between the low redshift photo Z priorities and the high redshift photo Z priorities, right? Um, if we have people who are looking, for example, the strong lensing or finding something and trying to figure out whether this, this object at redshift a dozen actually is redshift a dozen, uh, it's going to prioritize very differently from someone who wants to know whether this thing is redshift of 0.5 star forming a redshift of 0.3 passive, right? Something like that. So so to to bring up rail again, one of the, the strengths is that you can implement arbitrary metrics and they can they can consider low and high redshift estimated galaxies separately and evaluate that and, and so that uh, having having a framework where you can add in more metrics is powerful if we if we collectively use it. Cool. Um, one question I have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank everybody. You guys are very kind to indulge these questions. Thanks. Um, one question I had in the spirit of uh, rail for, uh, you know, collaborative use and uh, investment from the whole community is trying to understand exactly how rail and the Linnea photo Z server um, will interact, complement each other, et cetera, and hopefully trying to reduce, you know, duplicated effort. Um, if, if either Julia or, or Alex are able to kind of speak to how it seems these two things are going to mesh together. And not exactly uh, about the server, but the other uh, contribution that is to provide photo Z tables. In in this one, it really can be useful to reuse Rayo uh, to compute that photo Z. Uh, but it depends a lot of which photo Z we are uh, having to to run, and and if we will have the the time necessary to implement that inside rail to just reuse it. Melissa? There's another raised hand in the blue jeans, um, but it'll be a separate talk, Vic. Is it okay to move on? I think so. Okay, in that case, Marcus, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. I, I think uh, I can be very quick. Um, I was just um, hearing from, from the DESI team. I think it would be very, very important for LSST to, um, uh, LSST, LSST desk, sorry, to have some communication with um, the DESI team because the DESI sample is absolutely integral for us uh, in um, the validation and calibration of our sample redshift distributions um, in the context of the cross correlation methods. So um, there are several different um, aspects that are of, of importance, for instance, the modeling of galaxy dark matter bias. 
Um, so having um, a good understanding of the sample selection. Um, Jeff, perfect. You answer all my questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So just so it would be great to have this discussion. Um, that was everything. Yeah. Jeff offered to help facilitate as a DESI liaison. Thank you, Jeff, for that. I assume that's Jeff Newman? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. If there aren't questions in the room, I have a question, but I can't see if anyone in the room is waiting. Go ahead, Alex. Um, so, uh, so the people who have been developing Rail would really like it to be useful for everyone. Um, what are the barriers to all the other groups who are, you know, building similar infrastructure, what are the barriers to using this public tool? How can we how can we make this happen? Are there any science collaborations that would? Uh, are there any science collaborations that think they would like to get photosies from exterior to rail that would like to speak up? Or does everyone feel like we could all get on the rail, start using rail for for photosies for the whole group? Okay. I have a question for Alex about rail. I don't know anything about rail, but now I have links, so I look it up. But while you are online, I'm thinking that this framework could be used for purposes beyond photo Z. For example, in the context of stars, and we'll also have billions of stars in addition to billions of galaxies, there is something equivalent to photo Z, where you can use colors to estimate distance to stars. So algorithm itself is slightly different, but if you think of it as a black box, it's exactly the same thing. You feed it photometry and perhaps some other metadata, and it spits some distance estimate on the other side. So the question for Alex is, can you see rail being useful for things that are not photo Z, but conform to that model where I have photometry, I have black box algorithm, and I spit something out? Yeah, so so rail isn't like one algorithm for estimating photosies. It's just the the framework for for testing estimators of anything uh, by many metrics. So the same kind of framework you could you could use for anything. We're putting together something for uh, for deep blending. That's that's kind of a similar idea. Um, the metrics are more complicated, um, but this is. Yeah, that's that's kind of the general approach. So yes, that could also be done. In fact, I think I think you just it's only okay. Thanks. I'll look it up. Things, not not like the code. Um, like you put put in this estimator, and then instead of feeding it galaxy photometry, feed it stellar photometry. And... Thanks, Alex. Yeah, and I think if there are people who are interested in implementing those within Rail. If if they wanted to come to us, we, we'd be very happy to work with them to help them start getting those algorithms and metrics, et cetera, implemented in Rail so that they can run the similar kinds of tests during commissioning that we're going to run with the photosies. Obviously, that wouldn't be the responsibility of the photosie group, but we could use the same infrastructure and kind of you know develop alongside each other. Can I, we have another um, question from the room. Um, I'm still not clear how many exactly estimators there will be going into rail. So galaxies, we've discussed DEMP, and may, is there another estimator from Brazil, or is that just a hosting location? Sorry. 
uh, maybe, uh, and, and are there others? Um, because it sounds like rail benefits from having several estimators within it, but it's not clear to me what those would be. No, actually in Brazil, we are using LeFAR just as a use case to run the scalability tests and to, to, to test the, the infrastructure. Uh, we, are, we have to wait until the end of the validation cooperative to know which photo Z will be the official one and which would be the other one that we are going to run. And if we, uh, we are lucky enough in the one, this one is one of the, is already in uh, part of RAIL, we are very happy to, to run RAIL. Uh, and if not, we also can try to implement that in, in the, uh, at time. And I can also say that currently in RAIL, uh, we have a number of uh, different estimators implemented. Um, you know, there's, uh, BPZ and FlexiBoost, um, there's one based on normalizing flows, um, et cetera. And there's also several different um, estimators that are used for NFZ distributions. They're useful for, for cosmology. Um, and we, we're hoping that more people that have, you know, specific photo Z estimators that they need for their science um, will come implement it in RAIL with, with our help. Um, you know, we can't the, the rail development team can't commit to implementing all of the photo Z estimators that exist, but we're really hoping that people that say, like, I need this photo Z estimator for what I want to do can come to rail and the team can help them get it implemented in rail. Um, and that'd be really beneficial because then you can start running your estimator in the same pipelines, run the same tests, and it also uh, will allow everyone else to benefit from, from that implementation as well. Yeah, and, and to clarify the, it's, you don't have to like rewrite the the entire code. It's it's that it's wrapping. It's it's a, a system for for wrapping an existing code. Um, it's more complicated if it's not uh, in the same language as Rail. But like the idea is that it's it's straightforward to do, and so that's why we we really want lots of buy-in to do it. I think Marcus was raising his hand. Yes, I have um, one one comment. I think one aspect that's extremely important if we want to use rail for um, other aspects of um, um, of, of fitting um, you know spectra to um, to the photometry is developing or extending the development of polarization strategies because um, so. For example, in the current development of, of Ray, we have one in-kind contributor that um, does amazing work in parallelizing um, the evaluation of likelihoods across a, um, a large sample of, of, of galaxies. But this is certainly um, an aspect that is can, can get quite technical and um, uh, where I think a lot of a lot of um, you know work needs to be done in order to make sure that that uh, rail scales to the, to the very large sample size that we really would like, and this could give um, um, this could give you also a very nice incentive to apply rail to other areas because you have this uh, you would have this very general framework of, of parallelization. Um, this is one part, and the other part, which should also be mentioned, is that uh, by Alex and and, and uh, Eric uh, Charles, um, so uh, there is a development of of QP, which is essentially a framework to um, to process functional data, so uh, distributions mainly, and um, this is extremely useful in order to to deal with with redshift distributions. Um, so it's it's kind of linked to to the, the rail development effort, but it can be extended towards uh, other types of functional data. And to my knowledge, there is no uh, really, really a comprehensive package to do gradient evaluation on, on multidimensional functional data, clustering on functional data. These are all aspects that have a very broad applicability across science. So maybe this this would be something where uh, where we could where we could collaborate across uh, across different um, different co collaborations, science collaborations, and even with Link that has maybe more capabilities towards that. And so just a, just a thought. There's one more raised hand. 
in the blue jeans. If Marcus, that wasn't a, a, a question so much as a comment. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody has plans to, to work on similar aspects, um, I think it would be great to coordinate. So I, I just opened that up if, if there is some feedback um, on, on, on these points. It sounds like maybe no. Let's go to uh, Roberto. Feel free to unmute. Your hand Thank is you. raised. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about rail. Uh, I, I'm no nowhere. Uh, I should know a lot more about it <laughs> than than I do. So I wanted to ask uh, some kind of basic questions. But um, thinking about sort of rail for AGN, uh, are there any consideration specifically for variable sources that need to be taken into account? And in terms of considering things that are not specific galaxies, right, but are quasar dominated, for example, or AGN dominated, that's something that's easy as well for rail to manage? Does it only depend on the on the input codes or? Uh, so currently the assumption is that it's, it's using like object catalog kind of data. So, uh, so just there's there's photometry for from whatever annual release and uh, but you can you can attach uh, indicators of this is a variable source and so you can have metrics that are only evaluated for variable sources and you can attach other kinds of flags for them um, and so metrics evaluated on subsets seems like something that would be really important for any any of the time domain uh, populations. So you get you could get a measure of uh, if there's a certain estimator that performs well on AGN or uh, or other other kinds of time varying sources, um, and then compare them. Uh, yeah, and propagate that kind of like whatever error you get on on photosies with each estimator, you can forecast which one will be best for your science. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the mocks uh, that are produced, are they all based on DP0 or? Um, okay, so the the way Rail works for, for making mock data is uh, you can, you make a continuous model from whatever input you want, and you can then add complications to it. So, uh, so the initial tests are are with uh, DC2, which is what uh, DP0 is based on. Um, and any there there are ways to make it uh, look like other existing survey data. You can start it from something else, but the idea is it's like uh, extrapolative and interpolative. So it gives you uh, a realistically complex universe that is consistent with whatever the input was, but you know has has additional kinds of systematics. And so, so the idea is that we do robustness testing, uh, even if like we can't make an arbitrarily realistic mock catalog because then we would already have the results of LSST. We wouldn't need to do the survey. Um, so, so it's it's always good to keep that in perspective, and especially during commissioning when uh, ancillary like spectroscopic data will not be there won't be as much available at the beginning as there will be at the end so um so we are at the end of our time um so i want to thank everyone for coming today uh, it's good that we have started having these discussions about what needs to happen so we can commission our photo z's and start doing our science um, i'd encourage everyone to keep an eye on the photo z topic on community um, because this fall, there's plans to start ramping up the, uh, the commissioning process for PhotoZs, um, like the formation of the PhotoZ Science Unit for commissioning that Keith Bechtel talked about at the beginning of the session. Um, and it's important that especially for all the different science collaborations that have specific needs for their science, you know, it's, it's important that you have a representative involved in this process so that your needs can be met and so that we're ready to do your science when the data arrives um, and just to stay active in this process. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.